Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being with us today. We are broadcasting live from around the world, actually. Uh, we've got Australia, New York City, Park City, Utah, Irvine, California, and uh, North Carolina. Martin? Correct, sir. Yeah. And so uh, super excited and big thank you to Jean-Marc, who's on the uh, presentation here. You can see him there. We've known, I've known for years, and he is uh, working actively with Contact Organics, and he's the one that's responsible for bringing uh, Frank and Contact Organics to the Family Office Insights investor community. So um, we, can, we, we can't hear or see you, but we know you're there, and we encourage you to post your questions to the Q&A in the chat box as they come to mind. Uh, we have an hour, and it all... all Almost always this is not long enough, but if you have questions, please post them and we'll get to as many as possible. Uh, if after seeing what you see today, there's others in your world that would benefit uh, of knowing or learning about what you learned today, please feel free to contact Frank and John Mark directly. And we'll be doing a second webinar with more in depth uh, deal terms and that sort of thing, although we'll get to some of that today in about a week, and we'll make sure we uh, not only send you the recording of this one so you can share it with others, but also invitation to the next webinar with uh, the team from Contact Organics. We have the benefit also of having a couple people on the call that are involved in distribution and customers um, and investors. So you're gonna hear from them today as well. So with that, thank you for joining again today. And uh, uh, please feel free to post your questions and we'll get to as many as possible. So with that, Frank, thank you for being here. John, Mark, thank you again for arranging this. Uh, take it away, Frank. Arthur, thank you very much for having uh, us here at Family Office Insights to present uh, our business, uh, our activities and our opportunity. Contact Organics is an Australian business that has developed uh, breakthrough innovation in non-toxic weed control technology. Weeds are plants effectively that you don't want to have in your garden, that you don't want to have in your vineyards, in your agricultural setting, because they take moisture, they take minerals, they take you know, items of the food production that you don't want to have happen. Usually, weeds are being killed with chemical herbicides. Chemical herbicides are inherently toxins. The chemical herbicide market is worth $43 billion worth of sales. So we are spraying this amount of product on weeds or desiccate crops. And because of these products being toxins, they're not just killing only weeds or desiccating crops. They have a significant impact on, on the environment, on the biodiversity, on the soil biology and water-wise and water. Through the food, they enter our bodies and ultimately uh, damage our health. So Contact Organics, we have developed a breakthrough innovation in non-toxic weed control that delivers positive impact on our environment, on food and on public health. Where our product is coming or where our business is coming from, originally we started in health science. We have developed so-called colloidal chemistry as, as, as health supplements. We combined in a very unique way this delivery technology that we developed for colloidal systems with a weed killer, natural weed killer concoction. So through our proprietary delivery technology, we make natural active ingredients bioavailable and significantly enhance their performance. So we make bioherbicides that work and they're also beneficial for soil health. We focus on becoming the product of choice for the fast growing regenerative agriculture. So in, in, the, in, in general, we are, we're now at market ready state. We've set up everything. 
we have just achieved full EPI approval for our products after four years that are going through this approval process. We have products in stock in the US. Uh, we're ready for sale. And we're in the process now of raising $10 million um, to set up sales, marketing, uh, have enough money for, for working capital and, and go to market. That's where the stage where we're at. I think it's important to note here for the group, if it's okay, Frank, uh, that while the, uh, is it EPA, right? EPA, yes, correct. EPA has, un has basically unconditionally approved this, uh, that in the meantime, you've been able to penetrate the market and demonstrate, uh, I'm not sure efficacy is the right word, but success in terms of uh, customers and you using it. Um, and so I think that speaks volumes about adoption, like potential adoption. Yeah. And we talked about the pipeline and demand and that sort of thing. Um, do you think that uh, part of your ability to have the impact that you've had so far, aside from the science, is that people are aware more so than before, or at least interested in knowing what they're eating and how it came about and, you know, be it for the internet and, you know, just the volumes of information that are available mm -hmm. and the lawsuit with Monsanto and so on and so forth. Do you think that that's helped uh, you catalyze the interest is from business development perspective? Absolutely. Um, if you look, um, there is this litigation in place. <clears throat> and as I said before, and chemical herbicides are inherently toxins. That's the way they operate. They go into plants, shut down enzymes, and have that impact of killing weeds and having a much bigger kind of impact. That ruling by the World Health Organization five years ago, saying the major products or the major product in that field, glyphosate itself, is ca ca causing cancer. Uh, and now up to 150,000 people litigated that company for con contracting lymphoma cancer, um, being on, on TV every day of saying, have you sprayed that product? Have you got cancer? Talk to us, has triggered enormous awareness in the normal consumer that these products are really dangerous. So therefore, the practitioners like Martin, um, Kathleen, myself in the market, of course, we are aware of these are toxic products. They have implication on, as I said, not just on the health when you spray, but the product is just everywhere. It's in the soil and it's an antibiotic. It undermines the soil health. Most people in the field know that. A lot of people don't. When that product comes into 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 your body, it has an impact on health. We have huge amount of public health issues because these products effectively um, not just kill the weeds, but complex minerals take the minerals. They're leaching out the soils over a long period of time. The soil is being damaged. So that's really driving towards this regenerative farming movement to improve the soil, improve the health. And as we improve the soil health, we improve the quality of the food we improve the outcome for the farmers. We improve the outcome for us from a health perspective. It's a huge awareness. Yes, absolutely. But of course, there's huge, huge economic interest here because this is not just a herbicide. This is the whole way we do industrial, or I call it chemical farming. So it's a much, much bigger issue. So having said that, there is a huge opportunity for an alternative that works and it's non-toxic. In our case, we've independently validated with universities, the University of Missouri, that our product is good for the soil. So it's not just working, but it's beneficial. And hence, it goes into this regen farming movement. So therefore, the main challenges that we had, not we came from a very different angle. We came from health science. We're not a kind of chemical herbicide chemist or whatever. Our angle is different. That's the reason why... We have a unique product that no one has ever thought of 
because it's not about the 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 natural ingredients that can work, we make it work, we get it into the plant, we make it bioavailable, and therefore really enhance the performance. No one has come from that angle. So there's a huge demand at the moment for an alternative that works, but it's just not there. Therefore, Europe has not banned that glyphosate product because there's no economic alternative. So therefore, we had a product. Our main challenge, to be very open, is regulatory approved. Because of this litigation, because of the circumstances, regulatory um, hurdles have become unbelievable. If you look, our product is a natural product. It's in, in, in the oils we're eating every day. We're eating our type of product every day, but it has taken a four-year regulatory approval process for a natural product that is non-toxic, that is really when sprayed, um, yeah, you shouldn't spray it in your eyes directly, but otherwise it's non-toxic, it's harmless. It has taken us four years to get over the hurdles of being able to sell it in America unconditionally, unlimitedly. And that's the point we've reached now. It was a long, long journey, really tough. We bootstrapped the business to survive until then because you need income. But what we had, as you mentioned, we had a product that we had a, I would call it version one, a mixed kind of product, not the greatest offering at all, but we were able to combine a so-called active ingredient. We used the vinegar then with our delivery technology to demonstrate the technology. And with that combination that was not good, we weren't able to sell it on the, on the shelves. We couldn't sell it in California. We couldn't combine it. We couldn't pack it. So it's restriction, restriction, restriction but we have one major customers that validated that technology. One of them is, is Harvard University. They tested it for several years, very demanding, very high kind of uh, um, evaluation quality, but they confirmed this product works. We have, um, it's, it's used at the National Golf Course in Augusta with major regenerative farmers. We have, well, you, you Arthur, you're based in Utah. Utah is a very important market for us, uh, and Kathleen might like to talk a little bit about it. But uh, yeah, Park City is using it. Uh, several universities are using it. It's it's a really demand. So the markets that we focus on, based on these high profile customers, we have a million dollar sales revenue even in this restricted kind of environment. Yeah, therefore, our our customers that create that million dollars, we have a sales pipeline of hundred million US defined by these customers where we have business already. But typically, these customers start in a smaller spot, then they're going bigger, they're going bigger. And of course, as we have now the full regulatory approval, we only can now start selling. So we're looking in this $40 billion market. We're focusing on $14 billion. We're looking at what markets the higher value crop, where does it make sense? Where is it easy to enter because the demand is largest? We're going into the home and garden market in the public amenity, which means municipality, it's, it's schools, universities, playground, parks, golf courses. So that's the public space we're going. And then very important, we're going in, in, in the whole area of specialty agriculture, yeah, in vineyards, in horticultural operations, regenerative farming, as I said, is a huge opportunity for us because they have to improve the soil, they have to desiccate crops, we're doing crop desiccation. They're the markets uh, that we're going for uh, with vengeance. The Australian business is, is the test market for us. We market for two, year, two years with a different kind of products. We're operating some of the largest vineyards in the world. They're their 2,000 acre operation where we optimized how to spray, how to use it, that it works. They, they confirm that it works as well as a normal chemical herbicide, but it has the benefit of being non-toxic, good for the soil, no residue, no withholding period. It just makes sense to use. That's that's where we're at. Yes, so helpful. Um, I want to hear from uh, uh, Kathleen and Martin, but first, Jean-Marc, would you mind sharing with the group why you took this on as a project? Yeah, I've been in the clean tech, climate tech space for about 20 years. And um, actually, Frank and I worked on a bioplastics uh, business about 10 years ago together. And <clears throat> basically, when I look at the solution for contact that Contact Organics provides, um, there are multiple knock-on 
positive effects that trickle into different sectors of society that kind of transcends all of this, you know, left right arguments about um, about what what should um, what constitutes climate tech solutions that deserve being funded that uh, that both sides of the aisle can get behind. And, you know, safety, um, um, the health of the population and economics are things that most people can get behind. So if you look at 50 years of toxic herbicides that have demineralized soil, that demineralizes what you grow in it, we, and we eat that stuff, that's why we're all on, on, on supplements, right? Because we all become demineralized. And guess what? There's a direct correlation between the demineraliz demineralization of the human population and chronic ailments over time. Now, everybody's going to argue, is it direct? Is it indirect? Is it is it super strong or is there a causality? But the evidence is there. And so that produces what? Besides the defense industry, the biggest budget deficits on the planet are caused by mainly healthcare, right? So if you can improve health care as opposed to disease treatment, um, that's a winning combination. And the solution that Contact Organics has through this very innovative colloidal chemistry, which makes very simple ingredients bioavailable through plants. Nobody argues whether vinegars and whatnot once inside a plant will desiccate a plant. And instead of that plant becoming a a um, vehicle to transmit poison to kill the microbiology of the soil, right? That that mechanism of action of killing the plant turns the plant into mulch. And so it feeds the good biology, just like in your microbiome in your gut, it, you want that balance. You feed the good micro um, bacteria and, and they take over that microbiology and support a much healthier um, soil which over time has direct um, economic impact to farmers. Because remember, farmers don't make a lot of money. They, have, they don't have huge margins. You know, we could have the best solution, but if it's not economic, it's not, there won't be uptake and you know, we'll, we'll run out of money before we can get to profitability. So you don't want that. So we've been really focused, and I think this is what I like about the company. It's been very good steward of capital. Frank can talk about um, how the company can scale this at very with very low amounts of capex. The margins at 70% gross, 38% net are huge. I'm um, kind of almost like software margins. And the rationale for the seven market segments of each segment do have uncorrelated uh, reasons for adoption. Some are more safety, some it's customer demand. Some it's economics. Over time, the farmers, when they start seeing increases of five to ten percent on their crop yield, uh, reduction of water usage, um, improvement in carbon sequestration, all of those are uh, incremental, accretive value propositions to those farmers. Um, and so, yeah, I think it just makes a lot of sense. And it's a glow. It, this is going. This is going to be. We we believe. Besides Australia and the U.S., uh, the next stop is in. Um, the next two stops will be Europe and and Brazil. Everybody has the same issue. When France and the European Parliament in December really disappointed a lot of people when they were about. We everyone thought they were going to. Um, they were going to ban glyphosate, which has been banned in like a hundred company uh, countries. They said, well, we can't do that uh, right now, only in certain applications, because if we did, you know, essentially the our farming community would go out of business because not because we don't think it's an issue, it's there's no economic alternative. Well, we have that. So um it, it it's really just a matter of time. And uh yeah, I thought that that was worth my time and that's my most valuable commodity, and I'm spending it on this. So Boy. I'll stop there. Yeah, super helpful. Um, I think it would be interesting, but not right now, to get into the weeds. I've been dying to say that of how it works. <laughs> uh, uh, but ladies first, Kathleen, is that all right with you? Could you share a little bit with us? Fine, I'm happy to. My my husband and I invested in this company early on. We've been invested for several years. 
And I also represent the product. I'm out selling it. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I studied a lot of children's health and uh, environmental health. And I discovered that these uh, traditional conventional herbicides that are commonly being used everywhere from crops and our food supply to parks and schools to home gardens is seriously problematic for our health. And it is definitely causing harm to children. And there is a huge emergency right now with our nation's health, especially in the case of children. So my husband and I were very motivated to invest in a solution that people could use instead of Roundup. I started working in my own city of Irvine, California. And after a couple of years, I managed to convince them to adopt an organics first citywide policy for all city properties. And that happened in 2016. It's been so successful. We won an award from the California State EPA. I'm accredited in organic landscaping practices. And I've done extensive research into not only the health issues, but also soil issues and landscaping issues. And this product is the only product I was able to find that could actually replace Roundup. And that's really a big deal. There are other non-toxic and organic products out there, but none of them perform like ours. And ours stands out uh, because of the technology. It's highly effective. And you know, my client, Harvard University, they keep ordering, you know, they they tell their friends, other landscaping companies how much they love our product because the results are just amazing. And uh, Harvard is really all over this because not only do they make sure everything they use is scientifically lab tested and clean and so on, but they also study the results in the soil. And our product has been completely vetted also by Harvard, in addition to the University of Missouri. And I believe we also completed some recent soil studies showing that the microbiome benefits from the use of our product. And the our planet is in dire need of, of products that don't kill the soil. And this is it. This product is an answer to that. And not only that, it comes in at a cost that's comparable to conventional chemicals that farmers are using now. So that's my background and my experience has been nothing but positive with the product. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask me, but there is an extreme need for this. And I think that an investor who comes in uh, should consider the good that they'll be doing for the planet and for the climate because healthy soil pulls down and sequesters carbon. So a lot of my university clients are really excited about this product because many universities and cities now have goals, right? To be climate neutral or to improve what they're doing with carbon, to sequester carbon. And the very easiest tool we have all over the planet is the soil. And we just need to start caring for it and rebuilding the soil. And our health and the planet's health will follow by improving by using products like this one. So that's what sold us. And I've been out there working with it for about three years now. Park City loves us, Harvard loves us, like anywhere I'm selling, even though it was just the initial formulation with two components, um, everyone's very happy. And we're about to launch our new, new product now, Firehawk, which, which will be a single bottle formulation for which we got EPA approval. And um, speaking about EPA approvals, a lot of people don't know this, but the EPA's decision-making on products is not black or white, whether it's safe or not. Not that they didn't grill our product to the T, but a lot of products are out there and people think if they're EPA approved that they're automatically safe products. The yeah, EPA, good point, yeah. They actually don't consider where, whether some straight out safe or unsafe. What they consider is the economic benefit to the US economy versus the number of illnesses or injuries that product may cause. And they're very well aware of the detrimental health effects and soil effects of products like Roundup. However, they've been approved because they, they will provide an economic benefit. So I get discouraged sometimes, but I, I am encouraged by the, the awareness that's been raised through the lawsuits and there are thousands more coming. Bayer is, is very worried about their product Roundup and they should be. And incidentally, the lawsuits are only for a certain type of cancer and the health problems that have been documented over and over and over again from the use of Roundup are numerous. It causes numerous harms to our body. So 
that's why my husband and I invested. And that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing positive results. This is an amazing product, unlike any other that's out there. And if you're concerned about health, then you should be interested in our company. Super helpful, Kathleen. Thank you. Jean-Marc, you want to jump in before we get to Martin? I see your hand up there. Was that, is that it? Did you, did you, did, I think, did I think Alf is frozen. Is yeah. that or he's enraptured? Okay, Martin, why don't you go ahead and tell I, friends? I, yeah, okay. No office rapture here. Very very well said, both John Mark and Kathleen, and I applaud it and um reinforce it completely from our experience as farmers, regenerative farmers. We here at Union Grove Farm in North Carolina, we regard regenerative agriculture as the future of farming, not just in North Carolina and the United States, but globally. And it's not just a matter of we think it is or we hope it is, it has to be. Uh, why? Why are we saying that? Why are we so confident behind that? Because of key global drivers. Uh, we talk, there's been talk about sustainability around the globe in every different area of um, industry for many, many decades now, or certainly for the last two decades. But before we become sustainable, we have to regenerate. We don't want to we don't want to sustain the status quo because the status quo is broken in many different sectors. We always regard two sectors that we operate in or that, that we are closely aligned with is the farming agricultural sector that creates and provides the food. And then you've got the healthcare sector, which is as a result of not having nutrient and phytonutrient dense food. And because of the toxicity that we're pumping in, not just into the foods, but into the environment, as Kathleen and John Mark uh, reference. We're also in the climate disruption mitigation business as a regenerative farmer because regenerative farms will pull carbon from the atmosphere. Conventional farms release carbon into the atmosphere. Then we've got environmentalism, whether it's on land or on the rivers or on the seas. And this is why we're such an advocate, not just a, a, a client and a customer for Contact Organic, but we will be ongoing an advocate for this product because we feel so strongly about the critical importance of it to our business the environment people don't realize this i didn't realize this when i came into farming initially um we pour billions of pounds billions of tons of chemicals onto our crops in order to make them grow and in order to take them to market because we've denurtured the soils and that the one of the two reasons behind that one is we cut into the soils and we kill the microbiota and the biology that john mark referenced and then we come in behind that with chemicals synthetic chemicals petrochemical derivatives whether the fertilizers that we put in the soil to help the crops grow in this dead inner dirt it's not soil if it hasn't got biology in and then we come in behind that after we've cut into the soil and we spray 70 percent of what we spray on the crops 70 percent of what we spray onto the ground goes ends up in the rivers and the oceans 30 percent is actually affected this is a multi-trillion billion dollar industry across the planet and 70 percent of it is total waste it's never going to go any Every time there's a war and we seem to be living in an age of perpetual wars, there's always a spike in the in the petrochemical costs because it's linked to gas prices. So we're all we've been seeing a continuous rise in price and we're also been battling with conventional agriculture with Mother Nature. And that's not a good battle to take on because she's way smarter than we are. We're starting to finally realize that. And we're starting to see innovative companies coming in with a counter solution like Frank and Count Contact Organics that don't battle with Mother Nature. It's what I call dancing with her. And she leads. She's coming up all the time now with, with uh, weeds that will knock out the herbicides. It's not just that these... Uh, conventional herbicides are poisonous and toxic, not good for the crops, not good for the food, not good for the climate, not good for the environment. It's the fact that we're having to put more and more on and they're costing more and more. So I think John Luke, uh, sorry, John Mark also referenced the fact that farmers don't make a lot of money. 50% of the farmers, small and medium-sized farmers, not the not the huge industrial conglomerates, the industrial-sized factory farms, the cathos, they scale so they can get away with farming this way. Small and medium-sized farm, family farms and large-scale farms, and I'm talking thousands of acres, not five and 10 and 20 acres, 50% of those for the last 10 years are in debt. 
They carry a lot of assets in land, but they're carrying debt. So what we're seeing is we're seeing people getting out of farming and selling it off for for um, for real estate or for um, for other forms of investment on the land. So getting back to this, the last one I want to touch on before I move on to the product itself and the regenerative market is health and wellness. Obviously, food is linked to health and wellness. If we want to continue with the current model, which is disease management, then we continue with providing nutrient uh, foods that have got very little to no nutrients in them and very little phytonutrients. Phytonutrients are what give us our immunity system. If we haven't got it in the plant, we haven't got it in the food crop that then goes to market. And that's where regenerative farming comes in again. So we're very focused. Whilst we're a vineyard farm growing grapes, our focus for the first five years is the soil. We're soil farmers and we are microbiota ranchers. It's why as a farmer vineyard, I wear a cowboy hat because I'm a rancher. I'm breeding billions of life forms under the soil. Now, all the investment that we put in and all the work and all the technology, and we're working with some of the top, well, not some, we're working with the top regenerative experts in the whole of the United States, which is the epicenter of regenerative agriculture. If we follow their advice and we follow the principles that they're guiding us on and then come in behind and spray chemicals, which many regenerative farms who are going through a transition have to do, that kills the life force off. So the next best thing to spray synthetic chemicals is biopesticides. Unfortunately, with biopesticides, they can have a detrimental effect on the biology as well. They're also very, very expensive. And that's what stops people transitioning from conventional to organic. In this massive, vast continent of a country, we've got 900 million acres of agriculture. Less than 0.5% of that land is organic. That's incredible. We've got a 5% market. We import most of our organic goods. And a big reason behind that is farmers' number one enemy, number one challenge is weeds. We actually call weeds Mother Nature's cover crops because you have to cover your land when you're growing regeneratively. Weeds is the biggest challenge. I attend many conferences through the year, although I'm reducing that down as we expand our operation. The number one on the on, on, in, in the country, as far as I'm concerned, is, is, an, is a conference that's held every February called the Regenerative Nexus. That's some of the top farm operations in America, some of the top experts in the regenerative field get together and it's more of a brainstorm session than it is a conference. They have round tables, they have people presenting on stage. Number one every year for the last three years, the number one topic is weeds. Weeds is the number one topic because that is it's got a stranglehold on the crops. And if you can't find a way to knock them back, your crops aren't going to be able to grow regeneratively. So everybody is searching for a solution that's non-toxic in this area. So when I was very blessed to come into contact primarily with uh, initially, sorry, with uh, Frank's um, USA MD, Howard Vliger, who's called a he calls himself a student of the soil. This guy's a master. He's been a guru who's a mentor, to, a mentor to me now. I feel very privileged and honored to know that gentleman and to get to know Frank now. Has been incredible in giving of his knowledge and his guidance across our entire operation. He was recommended to me by our number one regenerative agriculture and farming um, guide, a guy called Todd Orrington, who works for uh, a lady called Dr. Elaine Ingham, who's the number one soil biologist on the planet. When Todd advises me to speak with someone, I speak with him. And two years ago, he asked me to meet Howard. And since then, we've been on a journey with Contact Organic. I work with a very successful, very wealthy VC. He's in the investment game, like I should imagine a large number of the audience are today. He's very, very wise with his money. I've been very good at making money for myself and other people in my life. He's very good at keeping hold of it. I'm still learning from him on that side. So when I go to him, I go to him as a VC, as someone looking for VC investment, cost, benefit, risk. I go heavy on the risk, heavy on the risk. And he knows what weed's about. We were spraying initially when we were a conventional farm, uh, glyphosate and Roundup, and it just was having a negative effect. The weeds are becoming resistant to it. We knew it was toxifying. We knew we weren't going to get the best crops. And then we were interested to regenerative. So suddenly that had to stop. So I'd been searching for three years for a suitable, economically viable bio herbicide. And I haven't found one yet. And we search across the planet. We're working with people in Israel, in New Zealand, in Australia, in Europe, <clears throat> and across America. We hadn't found one. The best that I could find 
was adequate. It's called to press. I'm not knocking it. It was a great job. Doesn't hold a candle to contact organic. And on two levels that were referenced above by Kathleen and John Mark, this product doesn't just knock the the weeds back. It by doing so and not killing it off and putting that toxicity in, it's breaking down the key elements of that plant into the soil that our microbiota that we put all our effort and energy into building then feeds off. That then strengthens the microbiota, that then strengthens the plant, that then gives us healthy crops, which in turn gives us healthy food, which will then be turned into our consumer. This will be a big part of my go to market strategy when we hit, we hit the major food retailers in 16 months time. We're a small outfit now, we're 70 acres, but we've got large plans. Over the next 10 years, we will scale this operation up to 1,000 acres, we'll be the biggest vineyard on the East Coast, and we'll probably be the biggest regenerative vineyard for a time in America. We're taking on the California market. That's 99% of the globe. Sorry, 99% of the market for grapes in this country is in California. Well, they're about to get some East Coast competition. The only way I can do that economically is to bring in what I call solution providers. And what Frank and his team have provided for us is my number one challenge, which was a herbicide that I could apply that's effective, but also that I can apply that's economical. And, and to, to know that we've now got this super concentrate coming in behind has put a smile on my face because it's put a smile on my governor's face, as I call the owner of this business. So I'm looking forward to putting that into effect as we scale out. I don't see any other that I've seen globally bio herbicide company on the planet that can touch what these guys are providing. So they've got my full support, which is why I was more than pleased and honored to come on here today and explain why we are a big fan of Contact Organic. Well, what an endorsement. Nicely done, everybody. John Mark, I see your hand up. Is that just a mistake or you're on mute? Or did you want to say something? You're on mute. Yeah. Mark, Martin, tell us how you really feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, very passionate about regenerative farming. and I'm very, very passionate about two things that I need to achieve here. One is provide a profit. And I said this when we go out, we present across the country now at regenerative conferences and conventional conferences. I said this to the farmers in the audience. I know you are suffering. I know you're struggling to turn a book. I know one or two of your family members are probably working a second job out there or you're having to employ agritourism to keep your farm afloat. I also know that your sons and daughters are no longer interested in coming in to keep that generational line. But I also know that like all human beings, you're change resistant. We have to crack open that change resistance in order to bring regenerative farming to the fore. This is a matter of importance and a matter of urgency. And the way to do that is profit. I will not be in my position. We will not be successful unless we are a profitable business. There's no thing wrong. It's not able to make a profit. There's different ways of making it. We believe we can do it in an environmentally conscious way that satisfies the health needs of our end consumers and do good at the same time while making a profit. When we put those two together, we actually think it will help us to generate greater profit as a result. But I'm dependent on standing on the shoulders of giants who went before me, who are the experts and guides that lead us in our in our principles and in our techniques and, and, and how we operate here. But I'm also, as I said earlier, dependent on the solution providers. We're big into precision ag as we are into re uh, regenerative ag. So we're all over AI and robotics and automa automation. In the next three to five years, we expect to see a great reduction in labor that is very difficult to get in farming because we'll be deploying robotics and AI. But we have to have the right tools at a ground level to bring that soil back to life. And that's, again, why companies like Org Contact Organics are very, very vital to us. Super. Yeah, I just want uh, uh, to, uh, Arthur, a couple of comments sure. uh, just to clear up because I saw another question. So one Contact Organics in the U.S. is not an organic certified solution. Just so to put that out there right away, Frank can talk about plans for that. Having said that, we are organic certified in Australia and awaiting organic regulatory approval there, which I think, Frank, you said you were expecting over the next year. So th yeah, that the was end of the year, it would be in place. Yeah, I, I just wanted to put, put that out there. And the second was... Um, 
claims by us and even people that are using uh, as as testimonials uh, like um, you know like Martin are great. <laughs> um, I saw one or two questions about um, any analyses or studies. So um, just to be clear, we do have a two year University of Missouri soil study analysis that uh, forms the basis of many of the um, statistics and data that we, or that Contact Organics um, has in its deck. And that can be shared, I guess, under NDA for anyone that's interested. Um, so I thought I'd add that. Yeah, one of the things I, uh, by the way, um, some who came on as attendees may have missed it, but uh, if you have questions, just write them in. We we can't turn on the the audio video for the attendees. So if you don't mind, uh, just write your questions in. Um, I know people are thinking about this, and we've talked a bit about it. But what what is the comp competition? The incumbent, the what's it called again? The uh, Bayer thing. Roundup. 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 Deficit, yeah. yeah. They're, you know, if you actually get some traction in a meaningful way, they're going to start freaking out, right? And they've got big, big wallets. What's what's that look like to you? Does it look like an acquisition? Does it look like they're going to try to fight you? Uh, we talked a little bit about, yeah. you know, Bobby and, you know, what we're doing with him politically. And I know that you have a relationship with him, but, uh, Tell us about how you see that um, as a benefit, as a hazard, you know, because people are thinking about that. Yeah. Arthur, let me respond to that or let me comment. Um, um, this is now my third environmental technology startup business that I'm building. The first two were in bioplastics. This one is in herbicides. What I learned there uh, and I think Martin uh, has, has touched on a lot of these elements. With an environmental solution, I've never, ever been in a bad first meeting, but then it's all about performance and price that drives the decision-making. So mm -hmm. a bioherbicide is no different to any other product. It has to perform at the right price. When you launch, you talk about the environment, but it's a very hard yakka to, to really get through. In bioplastics, I changed, I was the person to change over Nestle to bio-based packaging. I learned the hard way, if your product doesn't perform at the highest level, you will not get there. You're wasting your time. That's the reason why I go to market strategy is based on the product. It's superior in technology and performance because it makes these active ingredients bioavailable. It brings it into the plant that they can act where they should act to have the effect and then destruct the plant and give, give the goodies back into the soil that we talked about. But it's it's all about this, this, this performance. So it's we have been working day in, day out to look at all elements of the performance, what drives the outcome for our customers. And we fine tune, fine tune, fine tune. Talk about competition. Um, the big established play have a chemical herbicides, all are looking at alternatives. Even the big guys talk about, we have a $10 billion product sales, but the next one will be a non-toxic kind of version of it. We're looking all for that holy grail of high performance, cost-effective, non-tox, good for the soil kind of products. We are ahead of the time with our approach. There will be other approaches. I love other approaches because we need more solutions. This is not a, you're single in the field, you win the business. Forget it. We need more and more options. I see ourselves as a toolkit. I don't see them really as competitors. They're more comparators. We all look for our niche where our product works best, and then we go broader and broader, broader. So therefore, I welcome everyone that comes in because we have a different uh, kind of approach. So if you look in current kind of chemical herbicides, they have been optimized over 40 years. So Roundup Tarver product 40 years ago now is totally different. It's optimized in its formulations. But inherently where they're at at the moment, inherently they're toxins, as I said beforehand, but they're low cost. Hence your Mark's point, that's the reason why they're used. In line with Martin's kind of point, um, a lot of these chemical herbicides are very aggressive contact herbicides or um, 
or effectively poisons of just sprinkling around. Um, inherently, bioherbicides are so-called contact herbicides. So you have to spray the green parts of the plant to get into the plant, to dry it out, to break the cells and dry it out. You need higher concentrations and you need more product. Therefore, you're much higher cost inherently. So that's where we started. And I would call it the first generation products. That's what uh, Martin referenced to. A lot of products are out there. They need as high concentration to spray that they become poisons themselves, which Martin highlighted. So several of these kind of oil-based products you can't put on vineyards because the wine will take on the taste. So that's the issue. So inherently, we started with, with higher efficacy because of our approach to the, to the issues different through the delivery technology. We started at lower usage rate, therefore at lower cost. That was the starting point. That's a product that Kathleen referenced was our first generation product where we won already the harvest of the world because we started at lower pricing point at higher performance. And we have worked and see, we're not an overnight success. We've been working for five, six years in this space every day, every night to get it better. So what we have looked now in two parts and we have achieved, and Martin mentioned that, based on our work, we have now developed a so-called super concentrate that is two and a half times stronger and four times stronger than the other product. So two and a half times stronger of our product, four times stronger, which translates indirectly cost downs. So therefore, if you look without going too much numbers, if a normal herbicide is around between 10 and 50 US dollars per acre, normal bioherbicides are around three to $400 an acre, hence untouchable as Martin summarized. Our original kind of products, they're around $200 an acre. So they're lower for higher value crop works, but it's still to high cost. So through that super concentrate, we're coming down to around $80 an acre, which really gets us into where the alternative chemical herbicides operating it. We're now looking at, and there's a big work going on at the moment. It's not just the product itself, it's how you apply it. So we work on an application technology to reduce the spray volumes to make it charge that will bring us down based on the test we've done so far, down to 35 US dollar an acre, which is chemical herbicide cost structure at higher performance. So we have done this test for two years in Australia. I just got it back. There are a lot of tests going on. I got it from independent research organization that we need for the Australian regulatory approval that has validated our product works at concentration level, like it's called glufosinate. That's the alternative chemical herbicide that's being used. It works better. And at that pricing point, as we do, combined with this spraying, we're getting down further. And that's, that's the journey where we're in. But we welcome competition because it makes us all stronger. And we that's the reason we choose eight markets. Is yeah. home and garden. We're going in municipality. We're going regenerative farming. I want to talk about regenerative farm from our angle in a moment. Vineyards, and we go into invasive weeds. Martin mentioned weeds is the main problem because they become super weeds, become invasive. We have not found any kind of weed that's a super weed that is not killed by glyphs anymore that we're not killing because the why we're killing it is different. We're desiccating. Weeds cannot build a resistance with our product. That's a massive market. I could go in all different kind of details of what weeds actually killing because it's a multi-billion dollar opportunity for us. But having said that regenerative farming, as I said, we totally embrace it. And we have a wonderful customer, as Martin highlighted, but this was proven not just for environmental, but our product works that has been supported by us to get the right application technology with the product in place. The people that have endorsed us mostly is now regenerative farmers. It's a big movement, as we heard. The leaders of regenerative farmers, which is Guy Brown and Ray Archuletas, they're the big leaders, the big teachers of regenerative farming. There's a Common Ground, Kiss the Ground film coming out. It was a run up to the Oscars Award. It's being shown in, in movie theaters yeah, around it. the US. Yeah, yeah oh, fantastic. Guy Brown is so keen to have a solution he endorsed us so much that he became an advisor to our board. So Ray Archuleta, Gabe Brown, the leaders 
in regen farming that's at the moment moving towards 10% of American spices in the, for, for land agriculture. So 900 million acres is the total land. They're moving towards advising 30 million at the moment, moving towards 100 million. And this is a big movement. They have endorsed us. They're on our board. They're advising us how to go into market, what, what's the key requirement, how to implement it. And as Martin said, we have a team here in the US. Howard Flieger is leading it. We have already Kathleen. We have 11 distributors in the market already. We're doing the rise, not about developing the technology and spending the money in R&D. That's all done. We self-funded. We're doing it. It works. What we're doing at the moment, we're going into market. We're shipping containers. The next or the, the big containers arriving next week over in Savannah in the, in on the on the east coast. We have products in the market ready. The labels are being shipped. The, the website, we're changing our company name the, from Contact Organics to Contact Biosolutions. In line with uh, Jean-Marc's point, uh, we're not certified organic in the US at this stage. We will be, but not yet. And therefore, EPA had a problem with the company name Organics. So we continue Contact Biosolutions. Firehawk Bioherbicide is the product that's going to market. And we're raising money to get people on the ground, people like Kathleen, because when we demonstrate our product, people buy. But we need people on the ground selling. California is waiting to buy. The rest of the country is waiting to buy. We will go into retail. We need working capital and we need social media because we have a fantastic story to tell, but it has to be money spent to communicate it. That's the reason why we're raising money apart from doing European approvals and so on. But we're market ready. Next month we will sell. Every month will go up because with every state that's being registered and the whole range of my, of states will come on board this month, next month, California in four months, the products being shipped, sales will go up. We are, we're aiming to, to raise $10 million and be profitable within a year and a half to two years based on the traction we have. Yeah, Frank, a couple of points I just want to address quickly because I saw a few questions. So... The short answer of is Monsanto or Bayer, or Bayer going to try to quote crush us? Let's let's remember the company is at its core a technology company. It's got IP and patents filed globally, and the EPA is not um, so keen on um, enabling further chemical products into the market into the agricultural market. Um, and these big companies are talking about developing bioherbicides. So a bioherbicide, as Frank described, will kill through desiccation. If they come up with another way to kill through desiccation, that's a bioherbicide good on them. We'll have multiple years uh, head start. But if they want to touch getting any kind of non-toxic desiccating type ingredient into a plant, chances are they're going to infringe on our patent, which mm -hmm. is the, the method of delivery through the plant skin of colloidal chemistry that's been adopted from human skin. So that's point number one. So the answer is buy or, buy or build. They may be coming after us to buy us at some point. That, would, that wouldn't be out of the question. Uh, the second point as far as I, uh, just to to um, for people to be clear about is okay. How do you scale? So um, Frank uses the term um, or or the number of roughly two hundred fifty thousand dollars of capex scales a hundred million uh, revenue capacity. Why? Because this is very actually very simple to produce, um, and we have uh, maybe Frank you can you can talk about the manufacturing partner we have. But um, we can scale, we can do 100 million of revenue without any incremental capex, and we can scale an extra 100 million with another 250, even if it's three or 400,000 in capex, it's really insignificant. So I think those are, those are key to Martin's points um, of how do we get, keep the price down? Um, how do we scale and make people money that invest in this company? Because it's all well and good to have a sustainable solution but if the company's own business model is not sustainable, it doesn't matter. And um, yeah, so I thought I'd make those. Yep. Uh, 
So, Mark, perhaps a quick uh, addition to that is, yeah, talk about manufacturing, as I said, that's our expertise. I've set up uh, in 12 countries around the world manufacturing operation for global environmental technologies. We're really masters of that part. The way we set it up this time, um, no manufacturing in China. I've done that beforehand. We set up manufacturing in Thailand for global, and we're setting up in Atlanta for the U.S., for the large-scale agriculture that Martin, who is who has requirements coming short notice because weather is unpredictable, we can deliver locally. So that's why we set it up. It's a technology firm. So we set up um, in, in, in Bangkok with a company. It's called Nan Pao. They're our outsourced manufacturing partner. They're supplying Nike and Adidas with globally with their kind of glues. They're the masters of batch chemistry production. That's where we set up their factory, became underutilized because Nike moved to Vietnam from Thailand. The factory became available. We set up in their batch reactors. They're masters of batching, but they're not in herbicidal chemists, hence they're why we tracked it. They're billion dollar business by themselves. The, the owner saw what we were doing and loved what we're doing. He has become the major cornerstone investor of our business. So if you choose to invest, you're in with a billion dollar business. They invested today at six million dollars. And they help us really to with global supply chain, shipping, raw material purchasing. We're, we're getting leverage through our big brother, but they're really not in, in herbicide or chemists. That's what we do. I worked before and for Exxon. And as, as John Mark said before, and the typical thing, if you grow a business, you have to invest a million dollar in assets, manufacturing equipment to produce a million dollar in sales. Not here. It's just a simple batching process. We can manufacture in our current factory $100 million worth of goods right now, and we just need a filling line to pack it faster in, in bottles, and that's the requirement. So the money we're raising is not about equipment investment. It's all about people on the ground selling, telling the story through social media, and uh, more IP development, of course, and working capital, but not in equipment. So uh, along those lines, the customers that we've already sold to, who like Martin are, are awaiting the next versions, the new EPA approved here, the new EPA equivalent EPA in Australia approved, the organic in Australia. If we are simply penetrating the current customer base, that can generate the $100 million that Frank talks about yeah. without even new customers. Everything else is, is gravy. So, uh... Kathleen, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just had one thing to add. There was one question that came into the chat. I'm not sure whether everyone saw it, but it was about uh, how we compare it to other organic pesticides. Uh, we we whoop them all. Just long story short, um, and that's what Harvard University and the professional landscaping companies who are our clients are saying. They are saving money using our product, and it's far more effective than anything they've ever tried. Uh, in my NOFA certification, I learned about organic landscaping techniques and with or, within organic landscaping programs, you are allowed to use products that are not certified organic. So we fit into that because we're a bio herbicide and we support soil biology and we don't harm pollinators or the environment. And then I just kind of want to clarify a little bit, Frank, you may want to clarify about our organic certification in Australia, that that has been confirmed, correct? And then in the yeah, US, absolutely. we will be applying for organic certification. So the whole organic certification is quite a political kind of topic. So it's really, there are different views on that. We totally meet it in, in the whole context of it's good for the soil, no negative impact, totally biodegradable, no residues. But there's the element to what level can you actually convert a natural material in a in a conversion process? In Australia, we passed, uh, totally passed. I think we should have a good chance in Europe, but we're not approved in Europe. The US is under debate at the moment. We see different angles. We will get there. Uh, but now it's um, the product that we have is for regenerative farming. And Martin said that very clearly. There's just 0.5% of, of organic farming in the country, but is moving towards 10% of regenerative. Regenerative is much, much bigger, gives us more angle. Our product fits perfectly into that space. We meet it totally. We have the board members endorsing it, guiding us, and the product works, and that will be our major focus now. That's where the money sits, and that's where we will make significant margins and revenues and uh, 
will become the the product of choice for that market. Yeah, super. Could I, could I just? Sorry, I, I, could, I, I couldn't find the raise the hand signal. Um, can I just reiterate and underscore what Frank just said? Uh, I, I mentioned at the start when I was speaking about we firmly feel and are confident that regenerative will become the future of farming and the future of the future is here now, uh, for the reasons that Frank stated. That all that tiny little sliver of organics that we grow in this uh, country will be dwarfed in the next three to seven years by regenerative agriculture to the levels that Frank's saying. So that's not just a number he's pulled out of the air. It's what I used uh, when Greg and I, the owner, sat down to look at the numbers was follow the money. Big, not we're talking about big chemical companies coming in with alternates, big food and big food retailers are driving this revolution because of the consumer demands coming from not my generation, the baby boomers, but the Gen Z's and the millennials. Big food have committed, sorry, big food and big food retail have committed to over 100 million acres of transitional in the supply chain. The supply chain for food is farms. So they've gone out to the farms now and they've requested or they've offered to support and they're now starting to put their hand in the pockets and they're starting to fund the transition period for all of the reasons I gave earlier. And if you go on to any of the company reports of the multinational, multi-billion dollar food companies, you will see a commitment to regenerative agriculture and transition in the supply chain. We'll do it slowly at the start and then we'll see a hockey stick in the same way we saw it with sustainability. And I'll use Walmart as an example of that. 15 years ago, Walmart weren't interested in sustainability, but they very cleverly got behind it and they knew that it was a marketing tool, it was a PR tool. And then after two years, they found out that they'd saved themselves $250 million just within the supermarket operation from energy efficiency and waste reduction. They have come out and made a commitment to transitioning 50 million acres of their farmland, 50 million. You've got Nestle committed to nearly three and a half billion dollars of investment in regenerative. You've got Pro uh, Procter and Gamble. You've got PepsiCo. You've got General Mills. Each one of these are built in on five, tens, and nine. Now they're just using this as test and trial because the scale. We're doing it a thousand acres, and that that frightens the life out of me at times. The size and scale of a thousand acres. These guys are talking in millions of acres. And when they start seeing the monies that that will save the farmers, what does that mean? That means that they can start negotiating more profitable crops and feed the demands that's coming from the from the consumers. The Gen Zs and the millennials, and I always prefix that by saying the much maligned Gen Zs and millennials for the reasons we all know about, they're the ones asking questions about where's this food grown that we're buying? How did you did you did you spray anything on it? Did it affect the environment? Did it affect the community? Are you treating your animals? Are you treating your workers? Is this having an effect on climate change? All right. Uh, if you can't answer that question in a positive way, they'll switch the dollars. The vote at the ballot box counts for a little bit. The vote at the cash register counts for a lot. And that's why these people are changing. The biggest challenge they're going to face, as I said earlier, is the mindsets of farmers. Not because farmers are stupid. It's because they've got a lot tied up in this. And we're talking about generational mindset change. So the only way we're going to get through to these guys and women who are suffering in farming is to show them a profitable way to do that that also supports the environment. So we have we have to find backing for companies like Contact Organic to encourage them and others to come into this market to give the farmers like myself and the people that I work with across the nation now the tools that we need to deliver what the end consumers need. And when we do that, you're, you will benefit as a, as a consumer, whoever's out there today, and your children and your grandchildren will, will, will benefit from it as well. And if you look at the reports from these big food companies, they're not only committing to the millions of acres, they're committing to it by a set day, 2030. Do, this, do the math behind that. It's 2030 because of the Paris protocols. The yeah. climate driven first, but they're soon going to work. They're soon waking up to the fact that this is environmentally driven. It's nutritional and phytonutrient uh, driven, and they're going to get behind it in a big way. Have a look at Whole Foods in America. They tend to be drivers of the organic and the best care. You've got people like Sprite's Market. They have created a website purely about regenerative organics. Regenerative and organics, but mainly regenerative now. But we cannot achieve this without having the biological bridges to get us through to the nirvana, which we'll, be, we'll achieve when we have healthy soils again.
So, so I'd like to say thank you to Frank and to Kathleen and to John Mark for providing this. It's needed, guys. Yeah. It's Go ahead, Kathleen. Also, landscaping, every city, every university, every school, yeah. same thing. Water savings, improving the Absolutely. environment. Everybody yeah. needs it. I was so, going to strongly underscore water savings because we can talk about food and land and everything else, but we can't live for too long without fresh water. And uh, anybody who lives out west in the United States is realizing, um, or in Mexico, et cetera, like we're running out of fresh water. And um, water irrigation and um, um, efficiencies, improvements in use of water in agriculture is going to be a big, big, big deal. This helps to support that. I would, I, I would like, Frank, to just comment on one thing. One of the uh, questions was about valuation um, on your race. So maybe you want to. Or, or 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 Arthur, you can wind it up and and uh, along the raise. Uh, yeah, uh, so you, you can you can address that, Frank, real quick. But I just need to say we're you know uh, over time, and I have another commitment. So uh, why don't you address that real quick, and then we'll wrap it up. And just to let everybody know that we're get to all your questions that we didn't get to directly post webinar, and then. Uh, Go ahead, Frank. Yeah, we, we're going for a 10 million US dollar rise. We will use it for, the proceeds will be used for sales and marketing, people on the ground, working capital, um, that kind of thing. So not for us developing the business, that's all done. We have containers arriving in Savannah in the next days to go for sales. So therefore, $10 million rise. We're discussing at the moment a uh, 25% of the business for the 10 million. So it's a $40 million valuation. That's the discussion we have. But most importantly, the shareholders that we have in the business at the moment, they're all about commitment to support the business. So we, we're very keen to have people, they understand the space, impact investors, they want to make a difference. We, we have a unique impact investment opportunity that, that will generate very attractive financial returns. You heard about that. But as we just said in this kind of conversation too, we will have positive, measurable and social environmental impact at the same time. In this context, uh, I thank you all for, for the session today. Arthur, thank you so much. Looking forward to the pitch deck uh, presentation next week to talk more nuts and bolts of the business and the offer. Yeah, no, we really covered a lot of ground today. Super appreciate everybody being here. Um, Martin, uh, Kathleen and everybody who attended. Uh, nice job, Frank. And, and Jean Marc, really, really appreciate it. And so, uh, just to remind everybody, we'll be doing another session next week. We'll send you the details. And thank you all again. And thank you all who attended from Family Office Insights community. And as I always say, thank you for sharing with us the only thing you can't make more of, and that's your time. Till next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.